getting your exams back today. Um, so it should be equally shocking that we're having an SI session to go over the exam. Um, and none of that should have been shocking because we told you on Monday. So you should come to Rock 301 at 7.30 and go over your exam because it will be fun. Probably won't be fun, but it'll be informative. All right, there's, um, I've had several people send me things that they'd like to me to recommend for bonus opportunities. I will make those uh, assessments uh, tomorrow. So Friday I'll have a list of things that you can do uh, that are coming up. Um, let's see, somebody wants me to judge a uh, food competition and make, make attendance at that a bonus. I don't know about that. I haven't decided if I'm going to judge yet, probably, but. Did you say anything about the paper assessments? Did I say anything about the paper assessments? Okay. No, but I'm about to. Okay. Uh, my apologies for not getting the form up on the Blackboard site. Monday night after I, or Monday afternoon after I left here, I was working at my desk, and I have this very nice award that someone gave to me a few years ago sitting on the shelf above my desk. It's about a five pound piece of crystal, and it came tumbling down and landed on this and it landed about that far away from the hard drive. So I have been spending the last two days backing everything up because of course it's not backed up. How many of us actually back up files? So um, luckily the computer still works. See, there it is. Um, but I, uh, as soon as it landed on there, it, it's, it made a nice dent in the alt key, um, dented the board underneath it. It's, it's surprising it still works. Uh, but I was able to back up all the files there now. I haven't done much on this computer since then. So I have now posted to Blackboard I'll show you what it looks like. Because there is a simple set of instructions with it I'd like you to follow. Isn't Blackboard got a link on here? Under the course documents link, the first one is the PDF for your scores. Please note this. Okay, here it's going to disappear in a second, so let me go back. Complete the form. Email it back to me in case you don't know my email address. I gave it to you. Please use the subject line CHEM 106 term paper. That way I can filter the emails and put them all in one place. It'll make my job that much easier. If I go back into here now, this is all it is. Your case ID has to be in here. That's whoever's completing the form. Your name and how many points you want to give yourself. Your partner, however, the up to four partners. Points must add up to 60. It does not do error checking. I have to put it in the spreadsheet to do that. We didn't get that. Uh, the submit by email button I don't think is working. It might, but I would rather you just save the document and send it back to me. You can submit a comment and then type in your comment. There is a 2,500 character maximum on your comment. Okay? Yes? Because it's also going to be a bonus point form. It's a way for you to submit to me bonus points and they'll actually, these, instead of partners here, they'll be pu pull down menus that allow you to pick what you did. So again, it's an easy way for me to tell these. This is something my secretary's been working on for me. The other thing, though, is I'd like it to be able to submit it by email, and then it would come to me with a fixed subject line and everything. But we haven't debugged that yet. All right? And I went in to change this line earlier today and decided not to worry about it. OK, questions about that? Please get them into me by Monday. I will have your papers for you Monday. Uh, that gives me the weekend to make sure I've tallied everything right. Um, but they're out there now. It's on Blackboard under course documents. All right. Let's, let's finish up Chapter 18 because as I look through it, much of Chapter 18, as we've already talked about, are things that we already know how to do. They're thermodynamic state functions 
similar to enthalpy that we talked about before, uh, except now we've got the, as we were saying on Monday, delta H is enthalpy delta S is entropy and delta G is free energy the only one of these that there's some a few that need to be labeled yet if they're not in there, they're in the other small box. There they are. Uh huh. The only one of these three where you can actually get an absolute value of it equal to zero is the, s is the free energy. For all three of these, or for the, fir for the first one and the second, last one, we arbitrarily set the change in free energy equal to zero if you're forming elements. Well, uh, when we define the, the formation reaction, if I want to make hydrogen from hydrogen, it's pretty obvious that there's no change in energy in that process. So the change in energy to make hydrogen molecules from hydrogen, the natural form that you find it in, is going to be zero. There's no change. However, everything has an entropy except one thing, the third law of thermodynamics says that the entropy The entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is exactly zero. Well, once you know what the entropy of that perfect crystal is at that temperature, at any other temperature, you can figure out what the change in entropy is. And since the absolute entropy was zero at zero Kelvin, that tells you that I can get any S that I want. And so when we wrote the delta H of a reaction, whoops. as being the sum of the heats of formation of the products minus the sum of the heats of formation of the reactants. If you do the same thing for entropy, the change in entropy for a reaction it's just the sum of the absolute entropies. There is no change in entropy except for an overall reaction. So I can look up in a data table what is the entropy that this molecule has, have, what does the entropy that this molecule has at 25 degrees C. Remember that the superscript zero here means 25 degrees C, one atmosphere of pressure, one molar concentration. Those are the standard conditions. And once I know those two, I can get the change in free energy for any reaction by knowing it's delta H and it's delta S and the temperature occurs at. And I can go one step further. I can get the free energy change for any reaction at any temperature approximately by knowing the free energy, the, the enthalpy change at 298 Kelvin and the entropy change at 298 Kelvin. So, uh, Kelvin. so in other words, the values that are tabulated in your book and then just multiplying by the temperature that you're doing the experiment at. This makes one rather large assumption 
it assumes that delta H is independent of temperature and delta S is independent of temperature. The reality is both of them are temperature dependent. But because we don't want to worry about that, we can get an approximate value. How good is it? It's close enough for the work that we need to do. So if I were to ask you for the following reaction, To calculate the free energy change under standard conditions and to calculate the free energy change at 600 Kelvin, the way you would do this is first at the lower, at the lower temperature calculate delta G as being equal to delta H minus 298 Kelvin, that's the temperature, times delta S zero, and you get delta H and delta S from the information in the back of the book, in the appendix. Excuse me, that should be minus. <coughs> yep. For the, for the delta S, I expanded it out, giving you the absolute values. For the reaction I'm talking about, N2 plus 3H2 to give you 2NH3, delta S for that reaction would be 2 times the entropy of ammonia, the products, and you need the 2 because you make 2 moles of it, minus the entropy of nitrogen, one of the reactants, and minus the entropy, 3 times the entropy of hydrogen, the other reactant. You do the exact same thing for delta H, you plug everything in, you get delta G0. Now at the higher temperature, once you have these two, calculating this is very easy. You take those two values and just use 600 Kelvin instead of 298 and you figure, and you can calculate delta G for the reaction. And it's close enough for what we're doing, as I said. So there's a hint here. My new favorite reaction in the world, nitrogen plus three hydrogen give you two ammonias. If I talk about it in terms of an equilibrium reaction, they're all gases. Should I do it at high pressure or low to get lots of product? High pressure. You want to force, the higher the pressure, essentially you're going to increase the pressure by these two by forcing it over to the reactant side, the other way, you're looking at it that way. Should I do it in a large volume or a small volume? Small volume, I favor the side of the reaction that has small volumes. Is this reaction exothermic or endothermic? It ends up it's exothermic. So should I do it at high temperature or low? That would tell you you should do it at low temperature because heat is a product. If I do it at high temperatures, I'm forcing the reaction back to the reactant side, so that's not a good thing. So I should do it at a temperature that's going to favor the products. However, because it depends upon the collisions of nitrogen and hydrogen, I should do it at high temperature. What you want to find out and what you can do with delta G is we can say, okay, at what point does this thing become spontaneous? Go back to this equation.
I'm going to do four cases. The first case is what happens if you've got an exothermic reaction, so delta H is negative, and you've got a reaction that increases in entropy. So you're going downhill in enthalpy, you're going from a high enthalpy to a low enthalpy, which is what you want to have happen. You're going from a state with just a few places to put the energy to a state where there's lots of places to put the energy. You're increasing the entropy. Everything in nature says this reaction should happen. Well, if I plug in the numbers here and see what happens, if I plug in a negative number for delta H, doesn't matter what it is, it's just negative, and a positive number for delta S, temperature is always positive because you use absolute value, absolute temperatures. So the quantity of T delta S will be positive. So I've got a negative number minus a positive number. Is delta G going to be greater than, less than, or equal to zero? Less than. Any time delta G is less than zero, the reaction is spontaneous. It will happen without other influences. It doesn't mean it happens instantaneously, but it happens on its own. All right, let's go the other extreme. Let's make this an uphill in enthalpy process and it's going from a state where there's a lot of places to put energy to a state where there's only a few places to put energy. We're decreasing the entropy. Now you have a positive number, delta H, and you're going to subtract from it a negative number because temperature is positive, so temperature times delta S will be negative. So we have a positive minus a negative, we end up with a positive delta G those reactions will always be non-spontaneous. Or, I'll bring that back in a second, another way to look at it is that they're spontaneous in the opposite direction. Because if I change the reaction around, I change the sign on delta H, it becomes negative. I change the sign on delta S, it becomes positive. And so it's just like the one above it. The two other possibilities are those. So start with delta H being positive. If delta H is positive, you have an endothermic reaction and you increase the entropy, will delta G be positive or negative? And the answer is it depends. If T is low, then we've got a low value for temperature times a positive number and we have a delta H that's positive. The quantity here will be smaller than here. So if I have a big number minus a small number, what will happen? You're going to get a positive value. What if T is high? If T is high, now the quantity T times delta S, this one over here, is going to be greater than delta H, and so you'll get a negative value for delta G. Yes? What, I'm sorry? What do they consider high and low? It depends on the reaction. In general, these will be negative at high temperature. In other words, at a temperature high enough so that T delta S is greater than delta H. If T delta S is greater than delta H, then you end up with a negative value for delta G, and the reaction will be spontaneous. And so endothermic reactions, ones that go uphill in, in enthalpy, have to have be done at high temperatures. The other option, since it's completely the opposite of this, these will be negative at low temperatures. In other words, if you're at a value of T that's low enough so that T delta S 
is less than delta H, then you're going to get a negative mi number minus a positive number, and so you're going to, or excuse me, minus a negative number, and you're going to end up with a value that is still negative. What is it? How do you figure it out? Whoa, that wasn't smart. What happened here? That's the one thing that the computer is doing that I haven't figured out yet. I think it messed with the mouse. When delta G is equal to zero, you're at equilibrium. Well, if delta G equals zero, delta G, remember, is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So if delta G is zero, then delta H equals T delta S, or the temperature where you define the, the boundary between high and low is just the ratio of the enthalpy change to the entropy change. So it depends upon when you say what's a high temperature, what's a low temperature. This is a way to find out what is the temperature at which delta G is zero. Anything higher than that in that third case scenario, this one, would become spontaneous. And anything lower than that, and then this fourth case scenario, would become spontaneous. So you can figure out what that temperature is. Now, this brings in a problem. Because we've always said that every reaction ultimately, or we haven't always said, we've just recently been talking about equilibrium and we've said chemical equations try to get to equilibrium. There are no exceptions. Every e reaction wants to get to equilibrium. And yet we're calculating delta G values and we said that if delta G is less than zero, the reaction is spontaneous. So the question is, how do we co equate the two of those? Well, the first one is that the free energy change under standard conditions is going to be equal to a very simple equation related to the equilibrium constant. This is the same R that we use for the ideal gas law, except it's got energy units instead of liter atmosphere units. It ends up that liters times atmospheres are indeed an energy unit. It's just not one we use very often. So you can calculate an equilibrium constant if you know delta G zero for any reaction. Well, how do we get a reaction to have a delta G equal to zero then? Oops, I have the zero in the wrong place. Or do I? No, I don't. I always put the zero in the wrong place. Let me see what I want it. Uh-oh. Don't beep at me, computer. That's not a pretty thing. And I am missing a minus sign. I have to be. If K is very large, then we get lots of products, so we need a negative delta G. So the relationship between delta G for any reaction and delta G zero, the value of the free energy change at standard conditions, is simply what is Q? Q is that same thing we had from before. So for this reaction, Q it's the same thing as the equilibrium constant. Remember, you can calculate Q at any point in time where K is only true at equilibrium. So K is a specific 
uh, example of a Q, a reaction quotient. So what does this mean for chemical reactions? There's a great diagram in your book. Whenever I say great, it's worth looking at. Can I raise it up? What's K? Up here? That's the equilibrium constant. All right, so here's my chart. I've got reactants and products. And on this axis, I've got free energy. And when I find out is that if I plot free energy as a function of how far along are you from reactants to products, just a second. So here I've got pure reactants and here I've got pure products. What I find out is that the free energy starts at some value, which is the free energy of the reactants, and it would end at some value, which is the free energy of the products. This is the delta G of the reaction, products minus reactants. And this is equilibrium. It can be any equilibrium constant. Okay, if you're talking about a gaseous reaction, it's a Kp. For most other things, it's a Kc. Remember Ka, Kb, Kw, Ksp, Kf, all of those are all, K, all dependent on concentration. So those are all examples of concentration dependent K values. Does, I'm sorry? If the reaction is exothermic or endothermic, does that affect delta G? Yes or no? That's what delta H is. These are, this is an exothermic and exothermic reaction. These two are endothermic. So yeah, the uh, delta G does depend on whether it's exothermic. So what this is saying is that all exothermic reactions that increase in entropy are spontaneous. They give up energy. Well, that makes sense. You go from high energy to low. You go from disorder to disorder, if you like that. If you have an exothermic reaction that increases or decreases in entropy, it only happens at low temperatures spontaneously. That's what this table summarizes to you. That, this table is in your book, and yes, I always ask a question about it. Question. Yes? Shouldn't it dip down to zero? Why should it dip down to zero? If I go up a bit? Have I put any scale on it? No. So, yeah. That's zero. Where it's a minimum is zero. So what it's telling you is, and these are upside down actually, remember spontaneous reactions would be negative. At you, as you start with reactants over here, the delta G of the reaction, if it's negative, starts and the driving force of the reaction, the thing that makes it happen is the fact that delta G is very negative. Delta G wants to be zero. And so as it, the reaction proceeds, the value of delta G keeps changing. It gets less and less negative until it reaches zero. And then if it keeps going, the delta G is going to change sign again. It's going to ch get back the way it was. And so what you're trying to do in any chemical reaction is try to get to a minimum. This would be a great calculus problem. Find the minimum of this curve. The y-axis is G, not delta G, yes. The difference between them would be delta G. And so you can, you can sit and watch these, and so if you've got a reaction that's got a very large K,
it would look something like this where the minimum is very close to lots of products. You make lots of products. If you've got a very small value of K, just a second, I'll get it for you. Then the equilibrium is going to be closer to the reactant side. When delta G is zero, okay. you're no longer changing. When the reactant, the energy, the difference in energy between the reactants and products is the same. So is it zero? It's at delta G equals zero. I mean, and so th if you were to take this point here, here's the energy of the reactants, there's the energy of the products, the delta G is zero. Excuse me, this is reactants, this is products. Sorry, this is the free energy value of the reactants. That's the free energy of the products. There is no change. If I'm at another point, then this is the delta G of the reactants, and this is the delta G of the products. And so what, when, how's this working? I see where your confusion is. Yes, it's when delta G equals zero. So how does this plot read delta G? Is it like the slope then? Of course it's the slope. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that one? No, it doesn't have to. It's when it changes slope. <laughs> there we go. So it's got to be the, thank you. It's the slope of the line, so it's the change in the, sl uh, the delta G that matters. And so the slope of the line, obviously, at that point, at a minimum, is where it's equal to zero. Right? Okay. And I think, if you look through the chapter, that's all, the rest of it's all doing that. Now, it does do a great job describing, here's my, my pet peeve about uh, biology. Sorry, I have to pick on biology, I know. Don't you have a test coming up? Tomorrow? tomorrow? Yeah. Monday? Some of you tomorrow, some of you Monday. You know what? I'm not going to do this till after your test. It's, it's, you're not doing photosynthesis yet, are you? No. no. Been there, done that? 214's not doing it yet. Yeah, I'm going to leave it. No, I'm not going to torture you today, so, all right? I will get you a Kappa assignment. Look for it on Friday, now that the computer is working again, so you can practice some of these problems. They're all nice, simple algebra problems. This looks like you and me to hand these out. Now, settle down just a second. Jessica and I will uh, divide up these tests, and actually, you'll be able to get them yourselves, but we're going to spread them out. Let's. I'm sorry? We'll figure out where the bees go. Go ahead and turn on the lights first. Yeah?